Anytime we ingest macromolecules, for instance, proteins, carbohydrates, or lipids, we have to break these macromolecules down into their individual forms. So we break them down into the amino acids, the individual sugar monomers, glucose molecules, and into fatty acids. And ultimately, these three different types of molecules, amino acids, glucose molecules, and fatty acids, are brought into the cell and inside the cell, the cell metabolizes, breaks them down into ATP molecules via process known as aerobic cellular respiration. Now, these ATP molecules are used as energy molecules to carry out different types of processes and reactions that take place inside the cells. Now, the problem with aerobic cellular respiration is it produces a waste byproduct, namely carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide cannot actually be used by the cell in any useful manner. And so all these trillions of cells which use these food particles to metabolize them into ATP produce these CO2 molecules. And they essentially take these CO2 molecules and dump them into the blood plasma. Why? Well, because as the blood plasma circulates through our blood vessels, through our cardiovascular system, eventually the CO2 molecules will end up in the alveoli of the lungs. And it's the function, it's the responsibility of these alveoli to basically expel all that CO2 to the outside environment out of our body. And then the plants and trees can basically use the CO2 to produce the sugar molecules and then we can eat the sugar molecules and that process basically continues. Now the problem with this is when all these trillions of metabolizing cells dump CO2 into our blood plasma, the CO2 molecules themselves are nonpolar. But the blood plasma, which consists predominantly of water molecules, is polar. And so the CO2 in its CO2 nonpolar form cannot actually dissolve inside the red blood plasma, in, inside the blood plasma. And so what happens is the CO2 travels into the red blood cell. Now, once inside the red blood cell, we have the same problem again because the cytoplasm of the red blood cell consists predominantly of water. So just like the blood plasma, the cytoplasm inside the red blood cell is also polar. And so the carbon dioxide cannot actually be stored inside the cytoplasm of the red blood cells in its CO2 form. And so what ultimately has to happen is the cell has to carry out this particular reaction in which we transform the nonpolar CO2 molecule into its polar form by carbonate ion. And because this contains a full negative charge, it can easily dissolve inside the cytoplasm of the red blood cell and also inside the blood plasma of our body. So the problem with this reaction is, so if we study the rate of this reaction in its uncatalyzed form at a pH of 7 and, a, and at body temperature of let's say 37 degrees Celsius, we'll see that the rate of the reaction isn't that great. In fact, the rate is nowhere close to what it should be to actually be able to meet the demands of all the trillions of metabolizing cells found inside our body. So to basically increase the rate to a high enough value so that it can keep up with the demands of our body, what the red blood cells have is they have this enzyme we call uh, carbonic anhydrase 2. So inside our body, we have at least seven types of carbonic anhydrase enzymes, but the one that is found inside the red blood cells is known as carbonic anhydrase 2. Now, what we want to discuss in this lecture is the active side of this carbonic anhydrase 2. And we want to discuss the mechanism that this molecule actually uses to promote and catalyze this reaction. And what this reaction ultimately does is it hydrates the carbon dioxide, so water adds onto the carbon dioxide, and that ultimately <clears throat> And that ultimately produces the carbonic acid, which dissociates into bicarbonate ion and the H plus ion. So let's begin by taking a look at the active side of carbonic anhydrase 2.
So in our discussion on the mechanisms of enzymes, we said that one mechanism that enzymes use is known as metal ion catalysis. And in metal ion catalysis, the active side of the enzyme uses some type of metal ion to basically form a strong nucleophile. And that's exactly what we do in the active side of carbonic anhydrase too. So to see what we mean, let's take a look at the following diagram. So inside the active side of carbonic anhydrase too, and all of these carbonic anhydrases, we have a zinc metal atom. And any time any biological system uses a zinc atom in nature, the zinc atom always contains an oxidation state of positive 2. So it has a net charge of positive 2. And what that means is we have four different groups which are bound to that zinc atom. So this is a zinc atom. It has a charge of positive 2 and it is bound to four different groups. Now three of these groups are these ring structures that are part of the side chains of histidine residue. So we have histidine residue 1, 2, and 3, and they're bound to the zinc as shown. And the final group is a water molecule. And this is the same water molecule that will react with the carbon dioxide to ultimately produce the bicarbonate. So the first question is, what is the role that zinc actually plays? So what zinc actually does is, by reacting with the water, it transforms water into a much better nucleophile. And because water will be a much better nucleophile as a result of this interaction, it will be able to react with the carbon dioxide at a much higher rate, and so will produce these, carb uh, these bicarbonate ions, as we'll see in just a moment, at a much higher rate. So to see what we mean, let's compare the pKa values of these two reactions. So remember, the lower the pKa value, the better the acid. Now, if we take just plain water and we allow water to dissociate into H plus ions and these hydroxide ions, the pKa value is 15.7. And this is a very high value and what that or a relatively high value and what that means is this will not be a good enough acid and if it's not a good enough acid it will not be very likely to produce this hydroxide ion and as we'll see in just a moment it's the hydroxide ion that will be much more likely to act as a nucleophile and attack the carbon dioxide than the water now what this binding does is, because of this association, this reaction, the dissociation of that H plus ion to form the hydroxide and the H plus greatly increases, and so the pKa value decreases. So uh, because of this interaction between the zinc atom and the water, we basically decrease the pKa value of this uh, reaction and by decreasing the pKa value we essentially make it much more likely that the water will dissociate and produce that hydroxide and it's the hydroxide that will be more likely to actually react with the carbon of the carbon dioxide so based on experimental data we see that the binding of the zinc atom to water lowers the pKa value of water from 15.7 to 7.0 and this makes water much more likely to give up its hydrogen ion and become a hydroxide ion and why is that useful well it's useful because hydroxide ions are very very potent nucleophiles and so what that means is once we form that hydroxide it'll be much more likely to actually attack the carbon of that carbon dioxide to ultimately form that bicarbonate ion and to see what we mean let's take a look at this reaction mechanism that takes place inside the active side of carbonic anhydrase so in the first step, we essentially form this complex that consists of the water molecule bound onto that zinc. 
So what happens is the oxygen of this water contains a partial negative charge because remember it's more electronegative than either one of these H atoms. And so because of that partially negative charge on the oxygen, it will be attracted to the positive two charge on the zinc and that will form this bond as shown here. Now what that means is because this oxygen is interacting with the zinc, the interaction between the oxygen and either one of these H atoms will not be as strong. And so the hydrogen, one of these hydrogens, will basically be much more likely to dissociate from that oxygen. So water binds onto the metal zinc atom. The partially negative charge of oxygen is attracted to the, uh, to the positive charge of the zinc, and this decreases the ability of water to actually hold on to one of those H plus ions. And this is precisely what facilitates this process, the dissociation of the H from this oxygen to basically form this molecule here. And this is because the pKa value is lowered from 15.7 to 7.0. So this is very likely to actually take place. Now, once this takes place, now there's room for the carbon dioxide to basically enter the active side, the pocket of that enzyme. So this transforms a weak nuclear file into a very powerful nuclear file. So once again, as the H plus ion basically leaves the oxygen, we transform the water molecule, a poor nuclear file into a good nuclear file, a strong nuclear file, that hydroxide, and now the carbon dioxide basically enters the active site. Now, as the carbon dioxide enters the active side, what happens is the oxygen of that hydroxide attached to the zinc acts as a nucleophile, attacks the carbon of that carbon dioxide. And that displaces one of the pi bonds between carbon and oxygen. And so now, in the next step, we have a partial or we have a full negative charge on one of the oxygens, and that will be partially stabilized by the zinc coming by the positive charge coming from that zinc. And so we have this interaction shown in orange that is stabilizing this structure here. So in this step, we see the highly nucleophilic oxygen attacks the carbon of the carbon dioxide forming this bicarbonate intermediate shown here. And once we form this intermediate, because of the instability of this intermediate, and because we'll see another water molecule moving into the active side, that water molecule will essentially displace this entire molecule, and that water molecule will attach onto the zinc, displacing and replacing this bicarbonate, and that will kick off that bicarbonate, and will um, and and will go right back to this stage here. And so this reaction basically cycles back and forth and it takes place very, very quickly. And so every time this takes place, we produce a bicarbonate. So we transform our carbon dioxide into the bicarbonate, which then dissolves into the cytoplasm inside red blood cells and into the blood plasma inside our cardiovascular system. So we see that the proteases we discussed previously were basically examples of covalent catalysis and acid-base catalysis. And in some cases, in the case of metalloproteases, they used the metal ion catalysis. But in the case of carbonic anhydrase, these are examples of molecules which always use a metal atom, namely the zinc atom. And so these carbonic anhydrases basically use the mechanism we know as metal ion catalysis. They use the metal ion to basically create a much better nucleophile out of the water and that allows the hydroxide, the better nucleophile, to then attack the carbon of that carbon dioxide to ultimately produce that bicarbonate anion.